Chapter Eleven of Warwick the Kingmaker by Charles William Chadwick Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Triumph of King Edward. On the evening of that bloody Palm Sunday, King Edward, Warwick, and the other Yorkist chiefs slept in the villages round the battlefield. Next morning, however, they set their weary army on the march to reap the fruits of victory. In the afternoon they appeared before the gates of York, where the heads of York and Salisbury, bleached with three months of winter rains, still looked southward from the battlements. The citizens had, as was usual in the time, not the slightest intention of offering resistance, but they must have felt many a qualm as Edward's men, drunk with slaughter, and set on revenging the harrying of the south by the queen's army, drew up before their walls. Edward, however, had already fixed on the policy from which he never swerved throughout his reign. Hard measure for the great, and easy measure for the small. The mayor and citizens were allowed to find means of grace through Lord Berners and Sir John Neville, brother to the Earl of Warwick, doubtless through a sufficient gift of Rose Nobles. These two lords led the mayor and council before the king, who promptly granted them grace, and was then received into the town with great solemnity and processions. There Edward kept his Easter week, and made every arrangement for the subjugation of the north. His first act was to take down the heads of his father and his uncle from over the gate, and provide for their reverent burial. His next was to mete out to his Lancastrian prisoners the measure that York and Salisbury had received. The chief of them, Courtney, Earl of Devon, and the Bastard of Exeter were decapitated in the marketplace, and their heads went south to be set up on London Bridge. James, Earl of Wiltshire, long Salisbury's rival in the south, was caught a few days later and suffered the same fate. The submission of the various Yorkshire towns was not long in coming in and it was soon ascertained that no further resistance was to be looked for south of the Tees. The broken bands of the Lancastrians had disappeared from Yorkshire, and Warwick's tenants from Middleham and Sheriff Houghton were now able to come in to explain to their lord how they had fared during the Lancastrian ascendancy at the hands of his cousins of Westmoreland. In common with the few other Yorkists of the north, they had received hard measure. They had been well plundered, and probably constrained to pay up all that the Westmorelands could wring out of them, as arrears for the twenty years during which the Yorkshire lands of Neville had been out of the hands of the senior branch. A few days after Easter, Warwick and Edward moved out of York and pushed on to Durham. On the way they were entertained at Middleham, with such cheer as the place could afford after its plunder by the Lancastrians. Nowhere did they meet with any resistance, and the task of finishing the war appeared so simple that the king betook himself homeward about May 1st, leaving Warwick with a general commission to pacify the north. John Neville remained behind with his brother, as did Sir Robert Ogle and Sir John Conyers, the only two Yorkists of importance in the north outside the Neville family. The king took with him the rest of the lords, who were wanted for the approaching festivals and councils in London, and with them the bulk of the army. The task which Warwick had received turned out to be a much more formidable matter than had been expected. King Henry, Queen Margaret, the Dukes of Somerset and Exeter, Lords Hungerford and Ruse, with the other surviving Lancastrian leaders, had fled to Scotland, where they had succeeded in inducing the Scotch regents, Kennedy Boyd and their fellows, to continue the policy of the late king and throw themselves heartily into the war with the Yorkists. The inducement offered was the cession of Berwick and Carlisle, and the former town was at once handed over and well stuffed with Scots. Nor was it only on Scotch aid that the Lancastrians relied. They had determined to make application to the king of France, and Somerset and Hungerford sailed for the continent at the earliest opportunity. They were stayed at Dieppe by orders of the wily Louis XI, who was averse to committing himself to either party in the English struggle while his own crown was hardly three months old. 
but their mission was not to be without its results putting aside the hope of assistance from france and scotland the lancastrians had still some resources of their own on which they might count a few scattered bands of percy retainers still kept the field in northumberland and the percy crescent still floated over the strong castles of annick banborough and dunstanburgh the problem which fell into warwick's hands was to clear the routed lancastrians out of northumberland and at the same time to keep good watch against the inroads of the scotch and the english refugees who were leagued with them defensive and offensive operations would have to be combined for on the one hand the siege of the percy castles must be formed and sieges in the fifteenth century were slow and weary work while on the other the raids of the lords of the scotch border might occur at any time and place and had to be met without delay warwick was forced to divide his troops undertaking himself to cover the line of the tyne and observe the northumbrian castles while his brother john who for his services at towton had just been created lord montague took charge of the force which was to fend off scotch attacks on the western marches in june the scots and the english refugees crossed the border in force and their main body made a push to seize carlisle which the lancastrian chiefs the duke of exeter and lord grey de rougemont promised to deliver to them as they had already delivered berwick the town however shut its gates and the invaders were constrained to content themselves with burning its suburbs and forming a regular siege but as they lay before it they were suddenly attacked by montague who came up long before he was expected and beat them back over the border with the loss of several thousand men among the slain was john clifford brother to the peer who had fallen at towton almost simultaneously another raiding party led by lord ruse and sir john fortescue the late chief justice and guided by two of the westmoreland nevilles thomas and humphrey slipped down from the middle marches and attempted to raise the county of durham but as they drew near to the ancestral neville seat of bronspeth they were fallen upon by forces brought up by warwick and were driven back on june twenty sixth as disastrously as the main army for which they had been making a diversion these two defeats cooled the ardour of the scotch allies of the house of lancaster moreover trouble was soon provided for them on their own side of the border there were always discontented nobles to be found in the north and king edward was able to retaliate on the scotch regents by concluding a treaty with the earl of ross which set a considerable rebellion on foot in the highlands and the western isles by the time that the autumn came there was no longer any immediate danger to be apprehended on the borders and warwick was able to relinquish his northern viceroyalty and come south to pay his estates a flying visit and to obey the writ which summoned him in november to king edward's first parliament at westminster while warwick had been labouring in the north the king had been holding his court at london free to rule after his own devices at twenty edward the fourth had already a formed character and displayed all the personal traits which developed in his later years the spirit of the fifteenth century was strong in him cultured and cruel as skilled as the oldest statesman in the art of cajoling the people as cool in the hour of danger as the oldest soldier he was not a sovereign with whom even the greatest of his subjects could deal lightly yet he was so inordinately fond of display and luxury of all sorts so given to sudden fits of idleness so prone to sacrifice policy to any whim or selfish impulse of the moment that he must have seemed at times almost contemptible to a man who like warwick had none of the softer vices of self-indulgence still in mourning for a father and brother not six months dead with a kingdom not yet fully subdued to his fealty with an empty exchequer with half the nobles and gentry of england owing him a blood feud for their kinsmen slain at towton edward had cast aside every thought of the past and the morrow and was bearing himself with all the thriftless good humour of an heir lately come to a well-established fortune it seems that the splendours of his coronation feasts were the main thing that had been occupying his mind while warwick had been fighting his battles in the north 
reading of his jousts and banquets and processions his gorgeous reception by the city magnates and his lavish distributions of honours and titles we hardly remember that he was no firmly rooted king but the precarious sovereign of a party surrounded by armed enemies and secret conspirators in the lists of honours which edward had distributed after his return homeward from towton field warwick found that he had not been neglected the offices which he had held in fourteen fifty eight and fifty nine had been restored to him he was again captain of the town and castle of calais lieutenant of the march of picardy grand chamberlain of england and high steward of the duchy of lancaster in addition he was now created constable of dover and warden of the sink ports and made master of the mews and falcons and steward of the manor and forest of feckenham his position in the north too was made regular by his appointment as warden and commissary general of the east and west marches and procurator envoy and deputy for all negotiations with the scots nor had the rest of the neville clan been overlooked john neville had as we have already mentioned received the barony of montague george neville the bishop of exeter was again chancellor Falkenbridge, who had fought so manfully at Towton, was created Earl of Kent. Moreover, Sir John Wenlock, Warwick's most faithful adherent, who had done him such good service at Sandwich in 1459, was made a baron. We shall always find him true to the cause of his patron down to his death at Tewkesbury Field. Although several other creations swelled the depleted ranks of the peerage at the same time, the nevilles could not complain that they had failed to receive their due share of the rewards nor would it seem that at first the king made any effort to resent the natural ascendancy which his cousin exercised over his councils the experienced warrior of thirty-three must still have overborne the precocious lad of twenty when their wills came into contact the campaigns of fourteen fifty nine and sixty in which he had learnt soldiering under warwick must have long remained impressed on edward's mind even after he had won his own laurels at mortimer's cross and shared with the equal honours in the bloody triumph of towton so long as richard neville was still in close and constant contact with the young king his ascendancy was likely to continue it was when in the succeeding years his duties took him for long periods far from edward's side that the earl was to find his cousin first growing indifferent then setting his own will against his advisers then deliberately going to work to override every scheme that came to him from any member of the neville house we have no particular notice of warwick's personal doings in the parliament which sat in november and december fourteen sixty one but the language of his brother george the chancellor represents no doubt the attitude which the whole family adopted his text was amend your ways and your doings and the tenor of his discourse was to point out that the ills of england during the last generation came from the national apostasy in having deserted the rightful heirs so long in behalf of the usurping house of lancaster now that a new reign had commenced a reform in national morality should accompany the return of the english to their lawful allegiance the sweeping acts of attainder against fourteen peers and many scores of knights and squires which the yorkist parliament passed might not seem a very propitious beginning for the new era but at any rate it should be remembered to the credit of the nevilles that the king's council under their guidance tempered the zeal of the commons by many limitations which guarded the rights of numerous individuals who would have been injured by the original proposals moreover the government allowed the opportunity of reconciliation to many of the more lukewarm adherents of lancaster who had not been personally engaged in the last struggle it is to warwick's credit that his cousin rafe of westmoreland was admitted to pardon and not taken to task for the doings of his retainers under the conduct of his brother in the campaign of wakefield and st albans rafe was summoned to the parliament and treated no worse than if he had been a consistent adherent of york the same favour was granted to the earl of oxford till he forfeited it by deliberate conspiracy against the king 
sanguine men were already beginning to hope that king edward and his advisers would be induced to end the civil wars by a general grant of amnesty and might invite his rival henry to return to england as the first subject of the crown such mercy and reconciliation however were beyond the mind of the ordinary partisan of york and the popular feeling of the day was probably on the side of the correspondent of the pastons who complained that the king receives such men as have been his great enemies and great oppressors of his commons while such as have assisted his highness be not rewarded which is to be considered or else it will hurt as seemeth me but reason End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of warwick the kingmaker by charles william chadwick oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami the pacification of the north whatever the partisans of peace may have hoped in the winter of fourteen sixty one and sixty two there was in reality no prospect of a general pacification so long as the indomitable margaret of anjou was still at liberty and free to plot against the quiet of england the defeats of her scotch allies in the summer of fourteen sixty one had only spurred her to fresh exertions in the winter while edward's parliament was sitting at westminster she was busy hatching a new scheme for simultaneous risings in various parts of england accompanied by descents from france and brittany aided by a castilian fleet somerset and hungerford had got some countenance from the king of france and margaret's own hopeful heart built on this small foundation a great scheme for the invasion of england a scotch raid a rising in wales a descent of breton upon guernsey and jersey and a great french landing at sandwich were to synchronize if weather and wind had served them they should have had one hundred and twenty thousand men on foot in england upon candlemas day but weather and wind were unpropitious and the only tangible result of the plan was to cost the life of the earl of oxford who had been told off to head the insurgents of the eastern counties he had been taken into favour by king edward and we need have small pity for him when he was detected in correspondence with the queen at the very time that he was experiencing the clemency of her rival but it was an evil sign of the times that he and his son were executed not after a regular trial before their peers but by a special and unconstitutional court held by the earl of worcester as constable of england for this evil precedent warwick must take the blame no less than edward but margaret of anjou had not yet exhausted her energy so soon as the storms of winter were over and somerset returned from france without the promised succours she resolved to set out in person to stimulate the zeal of louis the eleventh and to gather help from her various relatives on the continent escaping from scotland by the irish sea she rounded the land's end and came ashore with her young son in brittany the duke gave her twelve thousand crowns and passed her on to her father rene in anjou from his court she went on to king louis who lay at rouen with him she had more success than might have been expected though far less of course than she had hoped louis was able to show that he had already got together a fleet reinforced by some breton and castilian vessels in the mouth of the seine in return for an agreement by which margaret promised the cession of calais and perhaps that of the channel isles he undertook to engage frankly in the war and to put at margaret's disposition a force for the invasion of england the way in which louis chose a leader for this army was very characteristic of the man he had in close confinement at the time a favourite of his father and an enemy of his own peter de Brézé, count of maulevrier and seneschal of normandy de Brézé was a gallant knight and a skilled leader only a few years before he had distinguished himself in the english war and among other achievements had taken and sacked sandwich the king now offered him the choice of staying in prison or of taking charge of an expedition to scotland in aid of margaret de Brézé, 
accepted with alacrity the latter alternative as much we are told from chivalrous desire to assist a distressed queen as from dislike for the inside of the dungeons of Loche. Quite satisfied, apparently at getting an enemy out of the country on a dangerous quest, Louis gave him twenty thousand livres in money, forty small vessels, and about two thousand men, and bade him take the queen whither she would go. While Louis and Margaret were negotiating, their English enemies had been acting with their accustomed vigor. When May came round, Warwick again resumed command of the northern border and marched out to finish the work that had been begun in the previous year. He was already on Scottish ground and had taken at least one castle north of the border when he received a herald from the Scotch regents offering to treat for peace. By his commission, drawn up in the last year, Warwick was authorized to act as plenipotentiary in any such matter. Accordingly, he sent back his army and went himself to Dumfries, where he met Mary, the Dowager Queen of Scotland, and the majority of the regents. They concluded an armistice to last till St. Bartholomew's Day, and then set to work to discuss terms of peace. The common report ran that the Scots were ready not only to give up the Lancastrian cause, but even to deliver over the person of King Henry. Moreover, there was talk of an alliance by marriage between the English king and a Scotch princess. This new departure, mainly brought about by the Queen Dowager's influence, was not without its effect on the Lancastrian partisans, who found themselves left unsupported to resist Warwick's army, which was, during the negotiations, put under the command of his brother Montague, and set to reduce the Northumbrian fortresses. King Henry fled from the Scotch court and took refuge in one of the castles of the Archbishop of St. Andrews, the chief member of the regency who opposed peace with England. Lord Dacre, brother of the peer who fell at Towton, surrendered himself to Montague and was sent to London, where King Edward received him into grace. Even Somerset himself, the chief of the party, lost heart and began to send secret letters to Warwick to ascertain whether there was any hope of pardon for him. Meanwhile, Newworth Castle was surrendered to Montague, and the more important stronghold of Annick yielded itself to Lord Hastings, who had been detached to form its siege. Bamborough was given up to Sir William Tunstall, and of all the northern fortresses, only Dunstaneborough remained in Lancastrian hands, and it seemed that this place must fall ere the year was out. Believing that the war was practically at an end, Warwick now turned south and rode up to London to lay the Scotch proposal before the king. But he had not long left the border when the whole aspect of affairs was once more transformed by the reappearance of Queen Margaret on the scene. While Montague and Warwick had been in the north, King Edward had been sorely vexed by rumors of French invasion. Seventy French and Spanish ships were roaming the channel, and Falconbridge, who had set out to find them with a hastily raised fleet, came home without success. A French force had mustered in Picardy, and Queen Margaret lay all the summer at Boulogne, tampering with the garrison of Calais, who had fallen into mutiny on account of long arrears of pay. But Calais failed to revolt, Louis made no serious attempt on England, and the Queen at last grew impatient and determined to start herself for England, though she could only rely on the assistance of Peter de Brézé and his two thousand men. Setting sail early in October, she passed up the eastern coast and landed in Northumberland, expecting that all the North Country would rise to her aid. No general insurrection followed, but Margaret's arrival was not without effect. Both Annick and Banborough fell into her hands, the former by famine, for it was wholly unvictualled and could not hold out a week, the latter betrayed by the governor's brother. Nor was this all. The presence of the queen moved the Scotch regents to break off their negotiations with England and denounce the truce which they had so recently concluded all that the statesmanship of Warwick and the sword of Montague had done for England in the year 1462 was lost in the space of a week. The moment that the unwelcome news of Margaret's advent reached London, Warwick flew to repair the disaster. 
only eight days after the fall of bamborough he was already at the head of twenty thousand men and hastening north by forced marches the king ill informed as to the exact force that had landed in northumberland had sent out in haste for every man that could be gathered and followed himself with the full levy of the southern counties the nearer the yorkists approached to the scene of action the less formidable did their task appear the approach of winter had prevented the scots from putting an army into the field and the lancastrians and their french allies had made no attempt to push out from their castles all that they had done was to strengthen the three strongholds and fill them with provisions in annock lay peter de brezé's son and some of the frenchmen together with lord hungerford somerset who had dropped his secret negotiations with warwick when his mistress returned from france held bamborough with him were lord roos and jasper earl of pembroke sir ralph percy the fighting man of the percy clan for his nephew the heir of northumberland was a minor had made himself strong in dunstanborough meanwhile the queen on the approach of warwick had quitted her adherents and set sail for scotland with her son and her treasure under convoy of de brezé and the main body of the french mercenaries but the month was now november the seas were rough and off bamborough she was caught in a storm her vessel with three others were driven against the iron-bound coast and she herself barely escaped with her life in a fishing boat which took her into berwick her treasures went to the bottom and of her french followers four hundred were cast ashore on holy island where they were forced to surrender next day to a force sent against them by montague warwick had now arrived at newcastle and king edward was but a few days march behind him though the month was november and winter campaigns especially in the bleak and thinly populated north were in the fifteenth century as unusual as they were miserable warwick had determined to make an end of the new lancastrian invasion before the scots should have time to move luckily we have a full account of his dispositions for the simultaneous siege of the three percy castles from the pen of one who served on the spot the army was arranged as follows king edward with the reserve lay at durham in full touch with york and the south the duke of norfolk held newcastle having as his main charge the duty of forwarding convoys of victuals and ammunition to the front and of furnishing them with strong escorts on their way to guard against any attempts made by roving bands of scots or percy retainers to break the line of communications thirty miles long which connected newcastle with the army in the field the force under warwick's immediate command charged with the reduction of the fortresses was divided into four fractions the castles lie at considerable intervals from each other first bamborough to the north on a bold headland projecting into the sea a norman keep surrounded with later outworks next dunstanborough nine miles farther south and also on the coast lastly annock five miles southwest of dunstanborough on a hill three miles from the sea coast overlooking the river Olne dunstanborough and bamborough if not relieved from the sea could be surrounded and blockaded with comparative ease annock the largest and strongest of the three castles required to be shut in on all sides and was likely to prove by far the hardest task luckily for warwick the roman road known as the devil's causeway was available for the connection of his outlying forces as it runs almost by the walls of annock and within easy reach of both dunstanborough and bamborough to each castle its own blockading force was attached opposite bamborough the one of the three which was nearest to scotland and most exposed to attack by a relieving army lay montague and sir robert ogle both of whom knew every inch of the border dunstanborough was beleaguered by tiptoft earl of worcester and sir ralph grey Annock was observed by Falkenbridge and Lord Scales. Warwick himself, with the general reserve, lay at Warkwith, three miles from Annock, ready to transfer himself to any point where his aid might be needed. The forces employed were not less than 30,000 men, without counting the troops on the lines of communication at Newcastle and Durham. To feed such a body in the depth of winter, 
in a sparsely peopled and hostile country and with only one road open was no mean task nevertheless the arrangements of warwick worked with perfect smoothness and accuracy good witness to the fact that his talent for organization was as great as his talent for the use of troops in the field every morning we are told the earl rode out and visited all the three sieges for to oversee and if they wanted victuals or any other thing he was ready to purvey it to them with all his power his day's ride was not less than thirty miles in all the army was in good spirits and sure of success we have people enow here wrote john paston whose duty it was to escort norfolk's convoys to and fro so make as merry as ye can at home for there is no jeopardy toward a siege at christmas tide was the last thing that the lancastrians had expected at the moment of their rising they had counted on having the whole winter to strengthen their position no hope of immediate aid from scotland was forthcoming and after three weeks blockade the spirits of the defenders of bamborough and dunstanborough sank so low that they commenced to think of surrender somerset as we have already mentioned had been in treaty with warwick six months before with the object of obtaining grace from king edward he now renewed his offer to warwick pledging himself to surrender bamborough in return for a free pardon ralph percy the commander of dunstanborough professed himself ready to make similar terms it is somewhat surprising to find that warwick supported and edward granted the petitions of somerset and percy but it was now two years since the tragedy of wakefield both the king and his cousin were sincerely anxious to bring about a pacification and they had resolved to forget their blood feud with the beauforts on christmas eve fourteen sixty two therefore banborough and dunstanborough threw open their gates such of their garrisons as chose to swear allegiance to king edward being admitted to pardon while the rest headed by jasper of pembrook and lord roos were allowed to retire to scotland unarmed and with white staves in their hands somerset and percy went on to durham where they swore allegiance to the king edward took them into favour and gave them his own livery and great rewards to somerset in especial a grant of twenty marks a week for his personal expenses and the promise of a pension of a thousand marks a year as a token of his loyalty somerset offered to take the field under warwick against the scots and he was accordingly sent up to assist at the siege of annick percy was shown equal favour as a mark of confidence the king made him governor of bamborough which somerset had just surrendered after the yielding of his chief adversary king edward thought that there was no further need for his presence in the north accordingly he returned home with the bulk of the army leaving warwick with ten thousand men commanded by norfolk and the earl of worcester to finish the siege of annick somerset lay with them neither overmuch trusted nor overmuch condemned by his late enemies warwick's last siege however was not destined to come to such an uneventful close as those of banborough and dunstanborough lord hungerford and the younger de Breze made no signs of surrender and protracted their defence till january sixth fourteen sixty three on that day at five o'clock in the dusk of the winter morning a relieving army suddenly appeared in front of warwick's entrenchments though it was midwinter queen margaret had succeeded in stirring up the earl of angus the most powerful noble in scotland and at that moment practical head of the douglases to lead a raid into england fired by the promise of an english dukedom to be given when king henry should come to his own again angus got together twenty thousand men and slipping through the central marches and taking to the watling street presented himself most unexpectedly before the english camp with him was peter de Breze, anxious to save his beleaguered son and the queen's french mercenaries for once in his life warwick was taken by surprise the scots showed in such force that he thought himself unable to maintain the whole of his lines and concentrated his forces on a front facing northwest between the castle hill and the river here he awaited attack but nothing followed save insignificant skirmishing angus had come not to fight but only to save the garrison when the english blockading force was withdrawn 
a party of scotch horse rode up to the postern gate of the castle and invited the besieged to escape accordingly lord hungerford the younger de Breze, sir richard tunstall and the great majority of the garrison hastily issued forth and joined the relieving forces then angus to the surprise of the english drew off his men and fell back hastily over the border warwick had been quite outgeneraled but the whole of his fault seems to have been the neglect to keep a sufficient force of scouts on the border if he had known of angus's approach he would have been able to take proper measures for protecting the siege but the main feeling in the english army was rather relief at the departure of the scots than disgust at the escape of the garrison if on that day the scots had but been bold as they were cunning they might have destroyed the english lords for they had doubled their numbers writes the chronicler the thing which attracted most notice was the fact that the renegade somerset showed no signs of treachery and bore himself bravely in the skirmish proving manfully that he was a true liegeman to king edward henceforth he was trusted by his colleagues some of the yannock garrison had been either unwilling or unable to escape with angus these protracted the defence for three weeks longer but on january thirtieth they offered to surrender and were allowed to depart unharmed to scotland the castle was garrisoned for the king and entrusted to sir john ashley to the great displeasure of sir ralph grey to whom it had been promised we shall see ere long what evils came from this displeasure it seemed now as if the war could not be far from its end no single place now held out for lancaster save the castle of harlech in north wales where an obscure rebellion had been smouldering ever since fourteen sixty one we must not therefore blame warwick for want of energy when we find that in march he left the indefatigable montague in command and came up to london to attend the parliament which king edward had summoned to meet in april nevertheless we shall see his absence had the most unhappy results on the border we have no definite information as to warwick's doings in the spring of fourteen sixty three but we cannot doubt that it was by his counsel and consent that in april his brother the chancellor and his friend lord wenlock in company with the borcher earl of essex went over sea to flanders and contracted with philip duke of burgundy a treaty of commercial intercourse and a political alliance philip then conveyed the english ambassadors to the court of louis of france who was lying at Edon, and with him they negotiated a truce to last from october first till the next year this was to be preliminary to a definite peace with france a plan always forward in warwick's thoughts for he was convinced that the last hope of lancaster lay in the support of louis and that peace between edward and the french king would finally ruin queen margaret's plans but while george neville and the burgundians were negotiating a new and curious development of this period of lingering troubles had commenced once more the lancastrians were in arms and again the evil began in northumberland sir ralph grey had been promised as we mentioned above the governorship of annick and had failed to receive it when the castle fell this so rankled in his mind that he determined to risk his fortunes on an attempt to seize the place by force and deliver it up again to the queen in the end of may he mastered the castle by treachery and sent for the lancastrians from over the border lord hungerford came up and once more received command of the castle which he had evacuated five months before the news of this exploit of grey's was too much for the loyalty of sir ralph percy the renegade governor of banborough when de Breze and hungerford came before his gates he deliberately surrendered the castle to them without resistance the exasperating news that the north was once more aflame reached warwick as he banqueted with king edward at westminster on may thirty first with his customary energy the earl set himself to repair the mischief before it could spread farther on june second he was once more marching up the great north road with a new commission to act as the king's lieutenant in the north while his brother montague was named under him lord warden of the marches warwick's plan of campaign this time was not to reduce the castles at once but to cut off the lancastrians from their base by forcing the scots to conclude peace 
Accordingly, he left the strongholds on his right and made straight for the border. His first exploit was to relieve Norham Castle on the English side of the Tweed, which was beset by 4,000 Scottish borderers aided by Peter de Breze and his mercenaries. Queen Margaret herself was in their camp and had dragged her unfortunate consort down to the seat of war. When the English appeared, the Scots and French raised the siege and retired behind the Tweed, where they set themselves to guard the ford called the Holy Bank. But Warwick was determined to cross. He won the passage by force of arms and drove off its defenders. A few miles across the border he found de Breze's Frenchmen resting in an abbey and fell on them with such vehemence that several hundreds were taken prisoners, including the Lord of Graville and Raoul d'Arenne, de Breze's chief lieutenants. One chronicler records a curious incident at this fight. At the departing of Sir Piers de Bressy and his fellowship, there was one manly man among them that proposed to meet with the Earl of Warwick. He was a tabouret, drummer, and he stood on a little hill with his tabor and his pipe, tabering and piping as merrily as any man might. There he stood by himself, till my Lord Earl came unto him, he would not leave his ground. Warwick was much pleased with the Frenchman's pluck, bade him be taken gently and well treated, and there he became my lord's man, and yet is, with him, a full good servant to his lord. The moment that Warwick was actually across the Tweed, the Scotch regents offered him terms of peace. To prove their sincerity, they agreed to send off Queen Margaret. Such pressure was accordingly put upon her that she, with all her counsel and Sir Peter with the Frenchman, fled away by water in four Balingari, and they landed at Schlausch in Flanders, leaving all their horses and harness behind them. So sorely were they hasted by the earl and his brother, the Lord Montague. With the horses and harness was left poor King Henry, who for the next two years wandered about in an aimless way on both sides of the border, a mere meaningless shadow, now that he was separated from his vehement consort. Now at last the civil war seemed at an end. With Margaret over sea, Somerset, a liegeman of York, the Northumbrian castles cut off from any hope of succor, and the Scots suing humbly for peace, Warwick might hope that his three years' toil had at last come to an end, that after all the struggle was to be protracted for twelve months more was a fact that not even the best of prophets could have predicted. After the raid which drove Queen Margaret away and turned the hearts of the Scots toward peace, we lose sight of Warwick for some months. We only know that for reasons to us unknown he did not finish his exploits by the capture of the Northumbrian castles, but came home in the autumn, leaving them still unsubdued. Perhaps after the winter campaign of 1462-63 he wished to spend Christmas for once in his own fair castle of Warwick. His estates indeed in Wales and the West Midlands can hardly have seen him since the Civil War recommenced in 1459 and must have required the master's eye in every quarter. His wife and his daughters too, now girls growing toward a marriageable age as ages were reckoned in the 15th century, must long have been without a sight of him. While Warwick was for once at home, and King Edward was making a progress round his kingdom with much pomp and expense, it would seem that Queen Margaret from the retreat in Lorraine to which she had betaken herself was once more exerting her influence to trouble England. At any rate, a new Lancastrian conspiracy was hatched in the winter of 1463-64, with branches extending from Wales to Yorkshire. The outbreak commenced at Christmas by the wholly unexpected rebellion of the Duke of Somerset. Henry of Beaufort had been so well treated by King Edward that his conduct appears most extraordinary. He had supped at the king's board, slept in the king's chamber, served as captain of the king's guard, and jousted with the king's favor on his helm. Yet at midwinter he broke away for the north with a very small following and made for the garrison at Annick. Probably Somerset's conscience and his enemies had united to make his position unbearable. The Yorkists were always taunting him behind his back, and when he appeared in public in the king's company, a noisy mob rose up to stone him, and Edward had much ado to save his life. But whether urged by remorse for his desertion of Lancaster, 
or by resentment for his treatment by the Yorkists, Somerset set himself to join the sinking cause at one of its darkest hours. His arrival in the north, where he came almost alone, for his followers were well nigh all cut off at Durham, was the signal for the new Lancastrian outbreak. Simultaneously, Jasper of Pembroke endeavoured to stir up Wales. A rising took place in South Lancashire and Cheshire, in which, at one moment, ten thousand men were said to have been in the field. A band set out from Anwick, pushed by the Yorkist garrison at Newcastle, and seized the castle of Skipton and Craven, hard by Warwick's ancestral estates in the North Riding, and Norham on the border was taken by treachery. In March, Warwick set out once more to regain the twice-subdued North. The rising in Cheshire collapsed without needing his arms to put it down, and he was able to reach York without molestation. From thence he sent to Scotland to summon the Regency to carry out the terms of pacification which they had promised in the previous year. The Scots made no objection, and offered to send their ambassadors to York if safe escort was given them past the Lancastrian fortresses. Accordingly, Montague started from Durham to pick up his troops at Newcastle, where Lord Scroop was already arrayed with the levies of the North Counties. This journey was near being Montague's last, for a few miles outside Newcastle he was beset by his cousin Sir Humphrey Neville, the Earl of Westmoreland's nephew, who fell on his escort with eighty spears as he passed through a wood. Montague, however, escaped by a detour and came safely into Newcastle, where he took charge of Scroop's force and marched for the Scotch border. At Hedgeley Moor he found Somerset with all the Lancastrian refugees barring the way. There had mustered all the survivors of the campaigns of 1461, 2, and 3, Roos and Hungerford, and Tailboys, Lord of Kyme, and the two traitors, Rafe Grey and Rafe Percy. On April 15th their 5,000 men fell on Montague, whose forces were probably about equal. The shock was sharp but short, and when Rafe Percy, who led his van, was struck down, the Lancastrians dispersed. Percy, if the tale be true, refused to fly with the rest, and died crying, I have saved the bird in my bosom, meaning his loyalty to Henry. He should have remembered his faith a year before, when he swore fealty to Edward at Durham. Montague was now able to reach Scotland unmolested. He brought the Scots commissioners back to York, and a fifteen years' peace was safely concluded, the Scots promising to give no further shelter to the Lancastrians, and the English to disavow the earls of Ross and Douglas, whom they had armed against the Scotch regency. And the Scots be true, the treaty may continue fifteen years, said the chronicler, but it is hard to trust Scots, they be ever full of guile and deceit. Somerset and his followers were now without hope. Their refuge in Scotland was cut off, and their Northumbrian strongholds doomed to a speedy fall, for King Edward had been casting all the winter a train of great ordnance, such as England had never seen before, and the pieces were already on their way north. Nevertheless, the desperate adherents of Lancaster hardened their hearts, gathered their broken bands, and made one last desperate stand for the mastery of the north. On the Lynn Hills, by the town of Hexham, they arrayed themselves against Montague on May 13th. But when the Yorkists came in sight, the hearts of the followers of Somerset failed them. All save five hundred melted away from their banners, and the small band that stayed to fight were broken, beaten, surrounded, and captured by Montague's four thousand men with perfect ease. The Lancastrian lords had fought their last field. One and all were slain or captured on the hill a mile outside Hexham Town, where they had made their stand. Montague marked his triumph by the most bloody executions that had been seen throughout the whole war. At Hexham next day he beheaded Somerset, Sir Edmund Fitzhugh, a moss-trooping captain called Black Jack, and three more. On the next day but one he slew at Newcastle Lord Roos, Lord Hungerford, and three others. Next day he moved south to his brother's ancestral seat of Middleham and executed Sir Philip Wentworth and six squires. Finally he conducted to York and beheaded there Sir Thomas Hussey and thirteen more, the remainder of the prisoners of rank who had come into his hands. For these sweeping executions Warwick must take part of the blame, but there is this to be said in defense of Montague's stern justice, that Somerset 
and three or four others of the victims were men who had claimed and abused Edward's pardon, and that Ruse and several more had been spared at the surrender of Banborough in 1462. The whole body had shown that they could never be trusted, even if they professed to submit to York, and the practical justification of their death lies in the fact that with their execution ceased all attempts to raise the North in favour of the House of Lancaster. Public opinion among the Yorkists had nothing but praise for Montague. Lo, so manly a man is this good Lord Montague, wrote a London chronicler. He spared not their malice, nor their falseness, nor their guile, nor their treason, but slew many and took many and let smite off their heads. Even before the Battle of Hedgeley Moor, King Edward had set out to reinforce Warwick and Montague. The news of their victories reached him on the way, but he continued to advance, bringing with him the great train of artillery destined for the siege of the Northumbrian fortresses. This journey was important to King Edward in more ways than one. How he spent one day of it, May 1st, when he lay at Stony Stratford, we shall presently see. If Warwick had but known of his master's doings on that morning, we may doubt if he would have been so joyous over his brother's victories or so remorseless with his captured enemies. The king came up to York in the end of May and kept his estate there solemnly in the palace, and there he created John Lord Montague, Earl of Northumberland, in memory of his good service during the last few months, handing over to him together with the Percy title the greater part of the great Percy estates, Annick and Warkwith and Langley and Prudhoe and many more fiefs between Tyne and Tweed. Warwick now advanced northward to complete the work which his brother had begun in the previous month, while the king remained behind in Yorkshire and occupied himself in the capture of Skipton Castle in Craven. On June 23rd the earl appeared before Annick and summoned the place. The Lancastrians had lost their leaders at Hexham, there was no more fight in them, and they surrendered at once on promise of their lives. Dunstanborough and Norham followed the example of Annick. Only Bamborough held out, for there Sir Rafe Grey had taken refuge. He knew that his treachery at Annick in the last year would never be pardoned, and utterly refused to surrender. With him was Sir Humphrey Neville, who had so nearly destroyed Montague two months before. We happen to have an account of the siege of Bamborough, which is not without its interest. When the army appeared before the castle, Warwick's herald summoned it in form, offering free pardon, grace, body, and livelihood to all, reserving two persons, Sir Rafe Grey and Sir Humphrey Neville. Then Sir Rafe clearly determined within himself to live or die within the place, though the herald charged him with all inconvenience and shedding of blood that might befall, saying in this wise, my lord ensureth you upon his honour to sustain this siege before you these seven years, so that he win you. And if ye deliver not this jewel which the king, our dread sovereign lord, hath greatly in favour, seeing it marches so nigh unto his enemies of Scotland, whole and unbroken with ordnance, and if ye suffer any great guns to be laid against it, it shall cost you a head for every gun shot, from the head of the chief man to the head of the least person within but Sir Rafe departed from the herald and put him in endeavour to make defence. Warwick was therefore compelled to have recourse to his battering-ram, the first that had been used to effect in an English siege. So all the king's guns that were charged began to shoot upon the said castle, Newcastle, the king's greatest gun, and London, the second gun of iron, so betide the place, that the stones of the walls flew into the sea. Dijon, a brass gun of the king's, smote through Sir Rafe Grey's chamber oftentimes, and Edward and Richard the Bombardels and other ordnance were busied on the place. Presently the wall was breached, and my lord of Warwick, with his men-at-arms and archers, won the castle by assault, mogre Sir Rafe Grey, and took him alive, and brought him to the king at Doncaster, and there the Earl of Worcester, constable of England, sat in judgment on him. Tiptoft was a judge who never spared, and Gray, a renegade, who could expect no mercy. The prisoner was sentenced to be beheaded and only spared degradation from his knighthood because of his noble ancestor who suffered at Southampton for the sake of the king's grandfather, Richard, Earl of Cambridge. His head was sent to join the ghastly collection standing over the gate on London Bridge. With the fall of Banborough, 
the first act of King Edward's reign was at an end. End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of Warwick the Kingmaker by Charles William Chadwick Oman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. The Quarrel of Warwick and King Edward. With Hedgeley Moor and Hexham, and the final surrender of the Northumbrian castles, ended the last desperate attempt of the Lancastrians to hold their own in the north. The few surviving leaders who had escaped the fate of Somerset and Hungerford left Scotland and fled over sea. Philippe de Comines soon after met the chief of them in the streets of Ghent, reduced to such extremity of want and poverty that no common beggar could have been poorer. The Duke of Exeter was seen, though he concealed his name, following the Duke of Burgundy's train begging his bread from door to door, till at last he had a small pension allowed him in pity for his subsistence. With him were some of the Somersets, John and Edmund, brothers of the Duke, who had just been beheaded. Jasper of Pembroke made his way to Wales and wandered in the hills from county to county, finding friends nowhere. No one could have guessed that the cause of Lancaster would ever raise its head again. The times of war were at length over, and Warwick, like the rest of Englishmen, might begin to busy himself about other things than battles and sieges. In July he was at last free and was able to think of turning southward to seek, for more than a passing visit, the Midland estates of which he had seen so little for the last five years. After a short interval of leisure we find him in September sitting in the King's Council, and urging on two measures which he held necessary for the final pacification of the realm. The first was the conclusion of a definite treaty of peace with France. It was from King Louis that the Lancastrians had been accustomed to draw their supplies of ships and money, and while England and France were still at war, it was certain that King Edward's enemies would continue to obtain shelter and succor across the Channel. Accordingly, the Earl urged on the conclusion of a treaty, and finally procured the appointment of himself and his friend and follower Wenlock as ambassadors to Louis. The second point of his schemes was connected with the first. It was high time, as all England had for some time been saying, that the king should marry. Edward was now in his twenty-fourth year, and men marveled that he abode so long without any wife and feared that he was not over chaste of his living. Those, indeed, who were about the king's person knew that some scandal had already been caused by his attempts, successful and unsuccessful, on the honour of several ladies about the court. Rumour had for some time been coupling Edward's name with that of various princesses of marriageable age among foreign royal families. Some had said that he was about to marry Mary of Gilders, the Queen Dowager of Scotland, and others had speculated on his opening negotiations for the hand of Isabel of Castile, sister of the reigning Spanish king. But there had been no truth in these reports. Warwick's scheme was to cement the peace with France by a marriage with a French princess, and in the preliminary inquiries which the king permitted him to send to Louis, the marriage question was distinctly mentioned. Louis's sisters were all married, and his daughters were mere children, so that their names were not brought forward, for King Edward required a wife of suitable years to raise him goodly lineage such as his father had reared. The lady whom Warwick proposed to the king was Bona of Savoy, sister to Charlotte, Queen of France, a princess who dwelt at her brother-in-law King Louis's court, and in whose veins ran the blood both of the kings of France and the dukes of Burgundy. King Edward made no open opposition to Warwick's plans. The project was mooted to King Louis, safe conducts for the English embassy were obtained, and Warren and Wenlock were expected at Saint-Omer about October 3rd or 4th. But at the last moment, when Warwick attended at Reading on September 28th to receive his master's final instructions, 
a most astounding announcement was made to him. We have an account of the scene which bears some marks of truth. The council met for the formal purpose of approving the marriage negotiations. A speaker, probably Warwick, laid before the king the hope and expectation of his subjects that he would deign to give them a queen. Then the king answered that of a truth he wished to marry, but that perchance his choice might not be to the liking of all present. Then those of his council asked to know of his intent, and would be told to what house he would go, to which the king replied, in right merry guise, that he would take to wife Dame Elizabeth Grey, the daughter of Lord Rivers. But they answered him that she was not his match, however good and however fair she might be, and that he must know well that she was no wife for such a high prince as himself, for she was not the daughter of a duke or earl, but her mother, the Duchess of Bedford, had married a simple knight, so that though she was the child of a duchess and the niece of the Count of St. Paul, still she was no wife for him. When King Edward heard these sayings of the lords of his blood and his council, which it seemed good to them to lay before him, he answered that he should have no other wife, and that such was his good pleasure. Then came the clinching blow. No other wife could he have, for he was married to Dame Elizabeth already. In fact, five months before, on May 1st, when he ought to have been far on his way to the north, King Edward had secretly ridden over from Stony Stratford to Grafton in Northamptonshire and wedded the lady. No one had suspected the marriage, for the king had had but a short and slight acquaintance with Elizabeth Grey, who had been living a retired life ever since her husband, a Lancastrian knight, fell in the moment of victory at the Second Battle of St. Albans. Edward had casually met her, had been conquered by her fair face, and had made hot love to her. Elizabeth was clever and cautious. She would hear of nothing but a formal offer of marriage, and the young king, perfectly infatuated by his passion, had wedded her in secret at Grafton in the presence of no one save her mother and two other witnesses. This was the urgent private business which had kept him from appearing to open his parliament at York. The marriage was a most surprising event. Lord Rivers, the lady's father, had been a keen Lancastrian. He it was who had been captured at Sandwich in 1460 and brought before Warwick and Edward to undergo that curious scolding which we have elsewhere recorded. And now this maid lord who had won his fortune by his marriage had become the king's father-in-law. Dame Elizabeth herself was seven years older than her new husband, and was the mother of children twelve and thirteen years of age. The public was so astonished at the match that it was often said that the queen's mother, the old Duchess of Bedford, must have given King Edward a love filter, for in no other way could the thing be explained. Warwick and the rest of the lords of the council were no less vexed than astonished by this sudden announcement. The earl had broached the subject of the French marriage to King Louis, and was expected to appear within a few days to submit the proposal for acceptance. The king, knowing all the time that the scheme was impossible, had allowed him to commit himself to it, and now left him to explain to King Louis that he had been duped in the most egregious way, and had been excluded from his master's confidence all along. Very naturally, the earl let the embassy drop, he could not dare to appear before the French king to ask for peace when the bond of union which he had promised to cement it was no longer possible. But vexed and angered, though he must have been at the way in which he had been treated, Warwick was too loyal a servant of the House of York to withdraw from his master's counsel. He bowed to necessity and acquiesced in what he could not approve. Accordingly, Warwick attended next day to hear the king make public announcement of his marriage in Reading Abbey on the feast of St. Michael, and he himself in company with George of Clarence, the king's brother, led Dame Elizabeth up to the seat prepared for her beside her husband, and bowed the knee to her as queen. For a few months it seemed as if the king's marriage had been a single freak of youthful passion, and the domination of the House of Neville and the royal councils appeared unshaken. As if to make amends for his late treatment of Warwick, Edward raised his brother George Neville, 
the Chancellor, to the vacant Archbishopric of York, and in token of confidence sent the Earl as his representative to prorogue a Parliament summoned to meet on November 4th. But these marks of regard were not destined to continue. The favours of the King, though there was as yet no open breach between him and his great minister, were for the future bestowed in another quarter. The House of Rivers was almost as prolific as the House of Neville. The Queen had three brothers, five sisters, and two sons, and for them the royal influence was utilized in the most extraordinary way during the next two years. Nor was it merely inordinate affection for his wife that led King Edward to squander his wealth and misuse his power for the benefit of her relatives. It soon became evident that he had resolved to build up with the aid of the Queen's family one of those great allied groups of noble houses whose strength the fifteenth century knew so well, a group that should make him independent of the control of the Nevilles. A few days after the acknowledgment of the Queen began a series of marriages in the Rivers family which did not cease for two years. In October 1464, immediately after the scene at Reading, the Queen's sister Margaret was married to Thomas Lord Maltravers, the heir of the wealthy Earl of Arundel. In January 1465, John Woodville, the youngest of her brothers, wedded the Dowager Duchess of Norfolk. This was a disgraceful match. The bridegroom was just of age, the bride quite old enough to be his grandmother. But she was a great heiress, and the king persuaded her to marry the sordid young man. Within eighteen months more, nearly the whole of the family had been married off. Anne Woodville to the heir of the Borcher Earl of Essex, Mary Woodville to the eldest son of Lord Herbert, the king's most intimate counsellor after Warwick in his earlier years, Eleanor Woodville to George Grey, heir of the Earl of Kent, and Catherine Woodville, most fortunate of all, to the young Duke of Buckingham, grandson of the old Duke who had fallen at Northampton. To end the tale of the alliances of this most fortunate family, it is only necessary to add that even before Queen Elizabeth's marriage, her eldest brother Anthony had secured the hand of Elizabeth, heiress of the Lord Scales, who was slain on the Thames in 1460. Truly the Woodville marriages may compare not unfavorably with those of the Nevilles. While the king was heaping his favors on the House of Rivers, Warwick was still employed from time to time in the service of the crown, but he could no longer feel that he had the chief part in guiding his monarch's policy. Indeed, the king seems to have even gone out of his way to carry out every scheme on a different principle from that which the earl adopted. In the spring of 1465, at the time of the queen's formal coronation in May, a ceremony which he was glad enough to escape, Warwick went overseas to conduct negotiations with the French and Burgundians. He met the Burgundian ambassadors at Boulogne and those of France at Calais. It was a crucial time for both France and Burgundy, for the war of the public wheel had just broken out, and each party was anxious to secure the friendship or at least the neutrality of England. With the Burgundians whom Warwick met first, no agreement could be made for the Count of Charolais, who had now got the upper hand of his aged father, Duke Philip, refused to make any pledges against helping the Lancastrians. He was at this very time pensioning the exiled Somersets in Exeter, and almost reckoned himself a Lancastrian prince, because his mother, Isabel of Portugal, was a granddaughter of John of Gaunt. Warwick and Charolais were quite unable to agree. Each of them was too much accustomed to have his own way, and though they held high feasts together at Boulogne and were long in council, they parted in wrath. There would seem to have been something more than a mere difference of opinion between them, for ever afterwards they regarded each other as personal enemies. King Louis, whose ambassadors met Warwick a month later, proved far more accommodating than the hot-headed Burgundian prince. He consented to forget the matter of the marriage, and agreed to the conclusion of a truce for eighteen months during which he engaged to give no help to Queen Margaret, while Warwick covenanted that England would refrain from aiding the Dukes of Burgundy and Bretagne, 
now in full rebellion against their sovereign. Late in the summer of 1465, Warwick returned home just in time to hear of a new stroke of fortune which had befallen his master. Henry the Sixth had just been captured in Lancashire. The ex-king had wandered down from his retreat in Scotland and was moving about in an aimless way from one Lancastrian household to another, accompanied by no one but a couple of priests. One of Henry's entertainers betrayed him, and he was seized by John Talbot of Basall as he sat at meat in Waddington Hall and forwarded under guard to London. At Islington, Warwick rode forth to meet his late sovereign, and by the king's orders led him publicly through the city with his feet bound by leather straps to his stirrups. Why this indignity was inflicted on the unfortunate Henry it is hard to say. There cannot possibly have been any fear of a rescue, and Warwick might well have spared his late master the shame of bonds. Henry was led along Cheapside and Cornhill to the tower, where he was placed in honourable custody, and permitted to receive the visits of all who wished to see him. That Warwick was not yet altogether out of favour with King Edward was shown by the fact that he was asked to be godfather to the Queen's first child, the Princess Elizabeth, in the February of the following year, 1466. But immediately afterwards came the succession of events which marked the final breach between the King and the Nevilles. In March, Edward suddenly dismissed from the office of treasurer Lord Mountjoy, a friend of Warwick's, and gave the post to his wife's father, Lord Rivers, whom he soon created an earl. The removal of his friend was highly displeasing to Warwick, but worse was to follow. Warwick's nephew, George Neville, the heir of his brother John, had been affianced to Anne, heiress of the exiled Duke of Exeter. But the Queen gave the Duchess of Exeter four thousand marks to break off the match, and the young lady was wedded to Thomas Gray, Elizabeth's eldest son, by her first marriage. This blow struck the Nevilles in their tenderest point. Even the marriages which had made their good fortunes were for the future to be frustrated by royal influence. The next slight which Warwick received at the hands of his sovereign touched him even more closely. His eldest daughter Isabel, who had been born in 1451, was now in her sixteenth year, and already thoughts about her marriage had begun to trouble her father's brain. The earl counted her worthy of the highest match that could be found in the realm, for there was destined to go with her hand such an accumulation of estates as no subject had ever before possessed. Half of the lands of Neville, Montacute, and Dispenser, and Beecham, the husband whom Warwick had hoped to secure for his child, was George, Duke of Clarence, the king's next brother, a young man of eighteen years. Clarence was sounded and liked the prospect well enough, for the young lady was fair as well as rich, but they had not reckoned with the king. After a long visit which Clarence and his younger brother Richard of Gloucester had paid to Warwick in the end of 1466, Edward got wind of the proposed marriage. When the king knew that his brothers had returned from their visit to the earl at Cambridge, he asked them why they had left his court and who had given them counsel to visit the earl. Then they answered that none had been the cause save they themselves, and the king asked whether there had been any talk of affiancing them to their cousins, the earl's daughters, and the Duke of Clarence, always prompted a lie, answered that there was not. But the king, who had been fully informed of all, waxed wroth and sent them from his presence. Edward strictly forbade this marriage, and for the present there was no more talk of it. But Clarence and Warwick understood each other, and were always in communication, much to the king's displeasure. It did not please him to find his heir presumptive and his most powerful subject on two good terms. The king waited a few months more and then proceeded to put a far worse insult on his old friends and followers. In May 1467, he sent Warwick overseas with a commission to visit the king of France and turn the 18 months' truce made in 1465 into a permanent peace on the best terms possible. The errand seemed both useful and honourable, and Warwick went forth in good spirits, but it was devised in reality merely to get him out of the kingdom at a time when the king was about to cross all his most cherished plans. 
Louis was quite as desirous as Warwick himself to conclude a permanent peace. It was all important to him that England should not be on the side of Burgundy, and he was ready to make the Earl's task easy. The reception which he prepared for Warwick was such as might have been given to a crowned head. He went five leagues down the Seine to receive the English embassy and feasted Warwick royally on the river bank. When Rouen was reached, the king gave the earl most honorable greeting, for there came out to meet him the priests of every parish in the town in their copes, with crosses and banners and holy water, and so he was conducted to Notre Dame de Rouen, where he made his offering. And he was well lodged at the Jacobins in the said town of Rouen. Afterwards, the queen and her daughters came to the said town that he might see them. And the king abode with Warwick for the space of twelve days, communing with him, after which the earl departed back into England. And with him went as ambassadors from France the archbishop of Narbonne, the bastard of Bourbon, admiral of France, the bishop of Bayeux, master Jean de Poupincourt, and William Moneypenny, a Scotch agent in whom the king placed much confidence. Warwick and the French ambassadors landed at Sandwich, where they had a hearty reception, for the people of Sandwich, like all the men of Kent, were great supporters of the Earl. Posts were sent forward to notify their arrival to the King, and the party then set out to ride up to London. As they drew near the city, the Earl was somewhat vexed to find that no one came forth to welcome them on the King's behalf, but presently the Duke of Clarence came riding alone to meet him, and brought him intelligence which turned his satisfaction at the success of the French negotiations into bitter vexation of spirit. When Warwick had got well over sea, the king had proceeded to work out his own plans, secure that he would not be interrupted. He had really determined to make alliance with Burgundy and not with France, and the moment that the coast was clear, a Burgundian emissary appeared in London. Antony, the grand bastard, the trusted agent of the court of Charolais, ascended the Thames at the very moment that Warwick was ascending the Seine. Ostensibly he came on a chivalrous errand to joust with the queen's brother, Lord Scales, in honor of all the ladies of Burgundy. The passage of arms was duly held to the huge delight of the populace of London, and the English chroniclers give us all its details, instead of relating the important political events of the year. But the real object of the bastard's visit was to negotiate an English alliance for his brother, and he was so successful that he returned to Flanders, authorized to promise the hand of the king's sister Margaret to the Count of Charolais. But Warwick had not merely to learn that the king had stultified his negotiations with France by making an agreement with Burgundy behind his back. He was now informed that only two days before his arrival, Edward had gone without notice given or cause assigned to his brother, the Archbishop of York, who lay ill at his house by Westminster Bars, and suddenly dismissed him from the Chancellorship and taken the great seal from him. Open war had been declared on the house of Neville. But bitterly vexed, though he was at his sovereign's double dealing, Warwick proceeded to carry out the forms of his duty. He called on the king immediately on his arrival, announced the success of his embassy, and craved for a day of audience for the French ambassadors. When the earl spoke of all the good cheer that King Louis had made him, and how he had sent him the keys of every castle and town that he passed through, he perceived from the king's countenance that he was paying no attention at all to what he was saying, so he betook himself home, sore displeased. Next day the French had the audience. The king received them in state, surrounded by Rivers, Scales, John Woodville, and Lord Hastings. The ambassadors were much abashed to see him, for he showed himself a prince of a haughty bearing. Warwick then introduced them, and Master Jean de Poupincourt, as spokesman for the rest, laid the proposals of Louis before the king. Edward briefly answered that he had pressing business and could not communicate with them himself, they might say their say to certain lords whom he would appoint for the purpose. Then they were ushered out of his presence. It was clear that he would do nothing for them. Indeed, the whole business had only been concocted to get Warwick out of the way. It was abortive and had been intended to be so. The earl on leaving the palace was bursting with rage, 
his ordinary caution and affability were gone and he broke out in angry words even before the foreigners as they rode home in their barge the frenchmen had many discourses with each other but warwick was so wroth that he could not contain himself and he said to the admiral of france have you not seen what traitors there are about the king's person but the admiral answered my lord i pray you grow not hot for some day you shall be well avenged but the earl said know that those very traitors were the men who have had my brother displaced from the office of chancellor and made the king take the seal from him edward went to windsor next day taking no further heed of the ambassadors he appointed no one to treat with them and they remained six weeks without hearing from him seeing no one but warwick who did his best to entertain them and warwick's new ally the duke of clarence at last they betook themselves home having accomplished absolutely nothing on the eve of their departure the king sent them a beggarly present of hunting horns leather bottles and mastiffs in return for the golden hanaps and bowls and the rich jewellery which they had brought from france warwick would have nothing more to do with his master he saw the ambassadors back as far as sandwich and then went off in high dudgeon to middleham there he held much deep discourse with his brothers george the dispossessed chancellor and john of montague the earl of northumberland at christmas the king summoned him to court he sent back the reply that never would he come again to council while all his mortal enemies who were about the king's person namely lord rivers the treasurer and lord scales and lord herbert and sir john woodville remained there present the breach between warwick and his master was now complete End of chapter thirteen chapter fourteen of warwick the kingmaker by charles william chadwick oman this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by pamela nagami playing with treason great ministers who have been accustomed to sway the destinies of kingdoms and who suddenly find themselves disgraced at their master's caprice have seldom been wont to sit down in resignation and accept their fall with equanimity such a line of conduct requires a self-denial and a high-flown loyalty to principle which are seldom found in the practical statesman if the fallen minister is well stricken in years and the fire has gone out of him he may confine himself to sermons on the ingratitude of kings if his greatness has been purely official and his power entirely dependent on the authority entrusted to him by his master his discontent may not be dangerous but warwick was now in the very prime of his life he was just forty and he was moreover by far the most powerful subject within the four seas it was sheer madness in king edward to goad such a man to desperation by a series of deliberate insults this was no mere case of ordinary ingratitude if ever one man had made another richard neville had made edward plantagenet he had taken charge of him a raw lad of eighteen at the moment of the disastrous rout of ludford and trained him in arms and statecraft with unceasing care twice had he saved the lost cause of york in fourteen fifty nine and in fourteen sixty one he had spent five years in harness in one long series of battles and sieges that his cousin might wear his crown in peace he had compassed sea and land in embassies that edward might be safe from foreign as well as from domestic foes he had seen his father and his brother fall by the axe and the sword in the cause of york he had seen his mother and his wife fugitives on the face of the earth his castles burnt his manors wasted his tenants slain all that the son of richard plantagenet might sit on the throne that was his father's due warwick then might well be cut to the heart at his master's ingratitude it was no marvel if after the king's last treachery to him in the matter of the french embassy he retired from court and sent a bitter answer to edward's next summons 
after the open breach there were now two courses open to him the first to abandon all his schemes and betake himself in silent bitterness to the management of his vast estates the second was to endeavour to win his way back to power by the ways which medieval england knew only too well the way which had served simon de montfort and thomas of lancaster and richard of york the way that had led simon and thomas and richard to their bloody graves the first alternative was no doubt the one that the perfect man the ideally loyal and unselfish knight should have chosen but richard neville was no perfect man he was a practical statesman the cleverest man of his time says one who had observed him closely and his long tenure of power had made him look upon the first place in the council of the king as his right and due his enemies the woodvilles and herberts had driven him from his well-earned precedence by the weapons that they could use intrigue and misrepresentation what more natural than that he should repay them by the weapon that he could best employ the iron hand of armed force hitherto the career of warwick had been singularly straightforward and consistent through thick and thin he had supported the cause of york and never wavered in his allegiance to it it must not be supposed that he changed his whole policy when his quarrel with the king came to a head as his conduct in fourteen sixty nine when his ungrateful master was in power was destined to show he had no further design than to reconquer for himself the place in the royal council which had been his from fourteen sixty one to fourteen sixty four later events developed his plans further than he had himself expected but it is evident that at first his sole design was to clear away the woodvilles the only element in his programme which threatened to lead to deeper and more treasonable plans was his connection with his would-be son-in-law george of clarence the handsome youth who professed such a devotion to him followed his advice with such docility and took his part so warmly in the quarrel with the king seems from the first to have obtained a place in his affections greater than edward had ever won but clarence had his ambitions what they were and how far they extended the earl had not as yet discovered warwick had now the will to play his master's new ministers an ill turn that he had also the power to do so none knew better than himself the lands of neville and montacute beecham and dispenser united could send into the field a powerful army moreover his neighbours in most of the counties where his influence prevailed had bound themselves to him by taking his livery barons as well as knights were eager to be of his privy council to wear his ragged staff and ride in his array the very aspect of his household seemed to show the state of a petty king every one has read hollingshead's famous description which tells how the little army of followers which constituted his ordinary retinue ate six oxen daily for breakfast nor was it only in the strength of his own retainers that warwick trusted he knew that he himself was the most popular man in the kingdom men called him ever the friend of the commons and his open kitchen persuaded the meaner sort as much as the justice of his cause his adversaries on the other hand were unmistakably disliked by the people the old partisans of york still looked on the woodvilles as lancastrian renegades and the grasping avarice of rivers and his family was stirring up popular demonstration against them even before warwick's breach with the king a great mob in kent had sacked one of rivers manors and killed his deer in the autumn of fourteen sixty seven and trouble was brewing against him in other quarters a word of summons from warwick would call rioters out of the ground in half the shires of england already in january fourteen sixty eight a french ambassador reports in one county more than three hundred archers were in arms and had made themselves a captain named robin and sent to the earl of warwick to know if it was time to be busy and to say that all their neighbours were ready but my lord answered bidding them go home for it was not yet time to be stirring if the time should come he would let them know it was not only discontented yorkists that had taken the news of the quarrel between warwick and his master as a signal for moving 
the tidings had stirred the exiled lancastrians to a sudden burst of activity of which we should hardly have thought them capable queen margaret borrowed ships and money from louis and lay in force at harfleur sir henry courtenay heir of the late earl of devon and thomas hungerford son of the lord who fell at hexham tried to raise an insurrection in the southwest but they were caught by lord stafford of southwark and beheaded at salisbury as a reward the king gave stafford his victim's title of earl of devon in wales the long wandering jasper tudor suddenly appeared at the head of two thousand men supported by a small french fleet he took harlech castle and sacked denby but a few weeks later warwick's enemy lord herbert fell upon him at the head of the yorkists of the march routed his tumultuous army retook harlech and forced him again to seek refuge in the hills herbert like lord stafford was rewarded with the title of the foe he had vanquished and became earl of pembroke while these risings were on foot lancastrian emissaries were busy all over england but their activity only resulted in a series of executions two gentlemen of the duke of norfolk's retinue were beheaded for holding secret communication with the beauforts while they were in flanders following the train which escorted the princess margaret at her marriage with charles of charleray who had now become duke of burgundy in london more executions took place and sir thomas cook late lord mayor had all his goods confiscated for misprison of treason two of the lancastrian emissaries alleged under torture the one that warwick had promised aid to the rising the other that lord wenlock warwick's friend and supporter had guilty knowledge of the scheme but in each case the king himself acknowledged that the accusation was frivolous the random imagining of men on the rack forced to say something to save their own bones it was not likely that warwick would play the game of queen margaret the slayer of his father and brother and the instigator of attempts on his own life startled by the sudden revival of lancastrian energy but encouraged by the easy way in which he had mastered it king edward determined to give the warlike impulses of his subjects vent by undertaking in the next year a great expedition against france he had the example of henry v before his eyes and hoped to stifle treason at home by foreign war among his preparations for leaving home was a determined attempt to open negotiations with warwick for a reconciliation the king won over the archbishop of york to plead his cause by restoring to him some estates which he had seized in fourteen sixty seven and about easter george neville induced his brother to meet the king at coventry warwick came but it is to be feared that he came fully resolved to have his revenge at his own time with his heart quite unsoftened toward his master yet he spoke the king fair and even consented to be reconciled to lord herbert though he would have nothing to say to the woodvilles he was also induced to join the company which escorted the princess margaret to the coast on her way to her marriage in flanders after this warwick paid a short visit to london where he sat among the judges who in july tried the lancastrian conspirators of the city clarence accompanied him and sat on the same bench he had spent the last few months in moving the pope to grant him a dispensation to marry isabel neville for they were within the prohibited degrees but under pressure from king edward the curia had delayed the consideration of his request the autumn of fourteen sixty eight and the spring of fourteen sixty nine passed away quietly warwick made no movement for he was still perfecting his plans he saw with secret pleasure that the french with whom peace would have been made long ago if his advice had been followed kept the king fully employed it must have given him peculiar gratification when his enemy antony woodville placed at the head of a large fleet made two most inglorious expeditions to the french coast and returned crestfallen without having even seen the enemy meanwhile the earl had been quietly measuring his resources he had spoken to all his kinsmen and secured the full cooperation of the majority of them george the archbishop of york henry neville heir to warwick's aged uncle lord latimer 
Sir John Conyers of Hornby, husband of his niece, Alice Neville, his cousin Lord Fitzhugh, and Thomas the Bastard of Folkenbridge, natural son to the deceased peer who had fought so well at Towton, were his chief reliance. His brother John of Montague, the Earl of Northumberland, could not make up his mind. He did not reveal Warwick's plans to the king, but he would not promise any aid. William Neville of Abergavenny was now too old to be taken into account. The rest of Warwick's uncles and brothers were by this time dead. By April 1469 the preparations were complete. Every district where the name of Neville was great had been carefully prepared for trouble. Kent, Yorkshire, and South Wales were ready for insurrection, and yet all had been done so quietly that the king, who ever since he had thrown off the earl's influence, had been sinking deeper and deeper into habits of careless evil living and debauchery, suspected nothing. In April, Warwick took his wife and daughters across to Calais, apparently to get them out of harm's way. He himself, professing a great wish to see his cousin Margaret, the newly married Duchess of Burgundy, went off to Saint-Omer. He there visited Duke Charles and was reconciled to him, in spite of the evil memories of their last meeting at Boulogne. To judge from his conduct, the Earl was bent on nothing but a harmless tour. But as a matter of fact, his movements were but a blind, destined to deceive King Edward. While he was feasting at Saint-Omer, he had sent orders over sea for the commencement of an insurrection. In a few days it was time to break out. Meanwhile, Warwick returned to Calais and lodged with Wenlock, who was in charge of the great fortress. His orders had had their effect. In the end of June, grave riots broke out in the neighborhood of York. Ostensibly, they were connected with the maladministration of the estates of St. Leonard's Hospital in that city, but they were in reality political and not agrarian. Within a few days, 15,000 men were at the gates of York, clamorously setting forth a string of grievances, which were evidently founded on Cade's Manifesto of 1450. Once more we hear of heavy taxation, maladministration of the law, the alienation of the royal estates to upstart favorites, the exclusion from the royal councils of the great lords of the royal blood. Once more, a demand is made for the punishment of evil counsellors and the introduction of economy into the royal household and the application of the revenue to the defence of the realm. The first leader of the rioters was Robert Hulliard, known as Robin of Reedsdale, no doubt the same Robin whom the Earl had bidden in 1468 to keep quiet and wait the appointed time. John Neville, the Earl of Northumberland, lay at York with a large body of men-at-arms for he was still lieutenant of the North. Many expected that he would join the rioters, but either because he had not quite recognized the insurrection to be his brother's work, or because he had resolved to adhere loyally to Edward, Montague surprised the world by attacking the band which beset York. He routed its vanguard, captured Haldyard, and had him beheaded. But this engagement was far from checking the rising. In a week, the whole of Yorkshire, from Tees to Humber was up, and it soon became evident in whose interest the movement was working. New leaders appeared, Sir John Conyers, the husband of Warwick's niece, and one of the most influential Yorkists of the North replaced Haldyard, and assumed his name of Robin of Reedsdale, while with him were Henry Neville of Latimer and Lord Fitzhugh. Instead of lingering at the gates of York, the great body of insurgents, rumor made it more than thirty thousand strong, rolled southward into the Midlands. They were coming, they said, to lay their grievances before the king, and in every place that they passed they hung their articles, obviously the work of some old political hand, on the church doors. King Edward seems to have been taken quite unawares by this dangerous insurrection. He had kept his eye on Warwick alone, and when Warwick was over sea he thought himself safe. At the end of June, he had been making a progress in Norfolk with no force at his back save 200 archers, a bodyguard whom he had raised in 1468 and kept always around him. Hearing of the stir in Yorkshire, he rode northward to Nottingham, calling in such force as could be gathered by the way. As he went, 
news reached him which suddenly revealed the whole scope of the insurrection the moment that his brother's attention was drawn off by the northern rising the duke of clarence had quietly slipped over to calais and with him went george neville the archbishop of york this looked suspicious and the king at once wrote to clarence warwick and the archbishop bidding them all come to him without delay long before his orders can have reached them the tale of treason was out within twelve hours of clarence's arrival at calais the long projected marriage between him and isabel neville had been celebrated in full defiance of the king warwick and clarence kept holiday but for one day the marriage took place on the eleventh and by the twelfth they were in kent with a strong party of the garrison of calais as their escort the unruly kentishmen rose in a body in warwick's favour as eagerly as when they had mustered to his banner in fourteen sixty before the battle of northampton the earl and the duke came to canterbury with several thousand men at their back there they revealed their treasonable intent for they published a declaration that they considered the articles of robin of reedsdale just and salutary and would do their best to bring them to the king's notice how the king was to be persuaded was indicated clearly enough by a proclamation which summoned out the whole shire of kent to join the earl's banner warwick and his son-in-law then marched on london which promptly threw open its gates the king was thus caught between two fires the open rebels lay to the north of him his brother and cousin with their armed persuasion to the south even before warwick's treason had been known the king had recognized the danger of the northern rising and sent commissions of array all over england two considerable forces were soon in arms in his behalf herbert the new earl of pembroke raised fourteen thousand welsh and marchmen at brecon and ludlow and set out eastward stafford the new earl of devon collected six thousand archers in the southwestern counties and set out northward the king lay at nottingham with lord hastings lord mountjoy and the woodvilles he seems to have had nearly fifteen thousand men in his company but their spirit was bad sire said mountjoy to him in full council of war no one wishes your person ill but it would be well to send away my lord rivers and his children when you have done conferring with them edward took this advice rivers and john woodville forthwith retired to chepstow scales joined his sister and the queen at cambridge meanwhile the northern rebels were pouring south by way of doncaster and derby their leaders conyers and latimer showed considerable military skill for by a rapid march on to leicester they got between the king and lord herbert's army edward for once out generaled had to follow them southward but the yorkshire men were some days ahead of him and on july twenty fifth reached daventry on the same day herbert and stafford concentrated their forces at banbury but on their first meeting the two new earls fell to hard words on a private quarrel and although the enemy was so near stafford in a moment of pique drew off his six thousand men to deddingham ten miles away leaving pembroke's fourteen thousand welsh pikemen altogether unprovided with archery next day all the chief actors in the scene were converging on the same spot in central england conyers marching from daventry to banbury pembroke from banbury to daventry with stafford following in his rear while warwick and clarence had left london and were moving by st albans on Tocester, the king following the yorkshiremen was somewhere near northampton conyers and his colleagues to whom belong all the honours of generalship in this campaign once more got ahead of their opponents moving rapidly on banbury on the twenty sixth they found Pembroke's army approaching them on a common road named Danesmoor near Edgecut Park, six miles north of Banbury. The Welsh took up a position covered by a small stream and offered battle, though they were greatly inferior in numbers. The northerners promptly attacked them, and though one of their three leaders, Henry Neville of Latimer, fell in the first onset, gained a complete victory. By force of archery they forced the Welsh to descend from the hill into the valley, though herbert and his brothers did all that brave knights could to save the battle the king was only a few hours march away indeed his vanguard under sir geoffrey gate and thomas clapham actually reached the field 
but both were old officers of Warwick, and instead of falling on the rebels' rear, proceeded to join them, and led the final attack on Herbert's position. Thunderstruck at the deep demoralization among his troops, which this desertion showed, the king fell back on Olney, abandoning Northampton to the rebels. Next day, it was July 27th, the brave Earl of Pembroke and his brother Richard Herbert, both of whom had been taken prisoners, were beheaded in the marketplace by Conyers' command without sentence or trial. Their blood lies without doubt on Warwick's head, for though neither he nor Clarence was present, the rebels were obviously acting on his orders, and if he had instructed them to keep their captive safe, they would never have presumed to slay them. Several chroniclers indeed say that Warwick and Clarence had expressly doomed Herbert for death. This slaughter was perfectly inexcusable, for Herbert had never descended to the acts of the Woodvilles. He was an honorable enemy, and Warwick had actually been reconciled to him only a year before. The execution of the Herberts was not the only token of the fact that the great Earl's hand was pulling the strings all over England. His special aversions, Rivers and John Woodville, were seized a week later at Chepstow by a band of rioters, probably retainers from the Dispenser estates by the Severn, and forwarded to Coventry, where they were put to death early in August. Even if Pembroke's execution was the unauthorized work of Conyers and Fitzhugh, this slaying of the Woodvilles must certainly have been Warwick's own deed. Stafford, the Earl of Devon, whose desertion of the Welsh had been the principal cause of the defeat at Edgecott, fared no better than the colleagues he had betrayed. He disbanded his army and fled homeward, but at Bridgewater he was seized by insurgents, retainers of the late Earl of Devon, whom he had beheaded a year before, and promptly put to death. It only remained to relate King Edward's fortunes. When the news of Edgecott fight reached his army, it disbanded, for the most part, and he was left with no great following, at Olney, whither he had fallen back on July 27th. Meanwhile, Warwick and Clarence, marching from London on Northampton along the Roman road, were not far off. The news of the king's position reached their army, and George Neville, the Archbishop of York, who was with the vanguard, resolved on a daring stroke. Riding up by night with a great body of horse, he surrounded only, the king's sentinels kept bad watch, and at midnight Edward was roused by the clash of arms at his door. He found the streets full of Warwick's men, and the archbishop waiting in his antechamber. The smooth prelate entered and requested him to rise and dress himself. Then the king said he would not, for he had not yet had his rest. But the archbishop, that false and disloyal priest, said to him a second time, Sire, you must rise and come to see my brother of Warwick, nor do I think that you can refuse me. So the king, fearing worse, might come to him, rose and rode off to meet his cousin of Warwick. The earl, meanwhile, had passed on to Northampton, where he met the northern rebels on July 29th, and thanked them for the good service they had done England. There he dismissed the Kentish levies, which had followed him from London, and moved on to Coventry, escorted by the Yorkshiremen, many of whom must have been his own tenants. At Coventry, the archbishop and his unwilling companion, the king, overtook them. The details of the meeting of Warwick and Clarence with their captive master have not come down to us, but apparently Edward repaid the earl's guile of the past year by an equally deceptive mask of good humor. He made no reproaches about the death of his adherents, signed everything that was required of him, and did not attempt to escape. The first batch of privy seals issued under Warwick's influence are dated from Coventry on August 2nd. The great earl's treacherous plans had been crowned with complete success. He had shown that half England would rise at his word, his enemies were dead, his master was in his power yet he found that his troubles were now beginning instead of reaching their end. It was not merely that the whole kingdom had been thrown into a state of disturbance and that men had commenced everywhere to settle old quarrels with the sword. The Duke of Norfolk, for example, was besieging the Paston's castle of Caister, and the commons of Northumberland were up in arms demanding the restoration of the Percys to their heritage. These troubles might be put down by the strong arm of Warwick, 
but the problem of real difficulty was to arrange a modus vivendi with the king. Edward was no coward or weakling to be frightened into good behavior by a rising such as had just occurred. How could he help resenting with all his passionate nature the violence of which he had been the victim? His wife, too, would always be at his side, and though natural affection was not Elizabeth Woodville's strong point, still she was far too ambitious and vindictive to pardon the deaths of her father and brother. Warwick knew Edward well enough to realize that for the future there could never be true confidence between them again, and that for the rest of his life he must guard his head well against his master's sword. But the earl was proud and self-reliant. He determined to face the danger and release the king. No other alternative was before him, save indeed to slay Edward and proclaim his own son-in-law Clarence for king. But the memory of old days spent in Edward's cause was too strong. Clarence, too, though he may have been willing enough to supplant his brother, made no open proposals to extinguish him. Edward was over a month in his cousin's hands. Part of the time he was kept at Warwick and Coventry, but the last three weeks were spent in the Earl's northern stronghold of Middleham. The few accounts which we have of the time seem to show that the king was all smoothness and fair promises. The earl and the archbishop, on the other hand, were careful to make his detention as little like captivity as could be managed. He was allowed free access to every one and permitted to go hunting three or four miles away from the castle in company with a handful of the earl's servants. Warwick, at the same time, gave earnest of his adherence to the Yorkist cause by putting down two Lancastrian risings, the one in favor of the Percys led by Robin of Holderness, the other raised by his own second cousin, Sir Humphrey Neville, one of the elder branch who was taken and beheaded at York. Before releasing the king, Warwick exacted a few securities from him. The first was a general pardon to himself, Clarence, and all who had been engaged in the rising of Robin of Reedsdale. The second was a grant to himself of the chamberlainship of South Wales and the right to name the governors of Carmarthen and the other South Welsh castles. These offices had been in Herbert's hand, and the earl had found that they cramped his own power in Glamorganshire and the South Marches. The third was the appointment as treasurer of Sir John Langstruther, the prior of the Hospitallers of England. He was evidently chosen as River's successor because two years before he had been elected to his place as prior in opposition to John Woodville, whom the king had endeavored to foist on the order. The chancellorship, however, was still left in the hands of Bishop Stillington, against whom no one had a grudge. George Neville did not claim his old preferment. By October, the king was back in London, which he entered in great state, escorted by Montague the Archbishop, Richard of Gloucester, and the Earls of Essex and Arundel. The king himself, writes one of the Pastons that day, hath good language of my lords of Clarence, Warwick, and York, saying that they be his best friends. But his household have other language, so that what shall hastily fall I cannot say. No more, we may add, could any man in England, the king, and Warwick included. End of chapter 14